Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as the former Prime Minister, Mr. Pavel Liponen, already indicated, the temporary conclusions of 1999 did not include um, funding for the newly agreed upon visa migration asylum policies. And here we are um, now at the eve of the adoption of a new multi-annual financial framework. And we're still feverishly thinking through how this new financial framework will support the EU's migration, asylum and migration policies in terms of those that are already agreed, but also those, who, uh, those that will be laid down in the new migration pact of the new EU leadership. There's great hope spinned on, on that financial framework in a sense that it's uh, to combine different kinds of objectives. The new financial instruments are to allow us to quickly get out of the starting blocks when a new emergency should unfold on the continent or in its neighborhood. But we also entertain ambitions that it will allow us to strengthen um, the muscle power to build up robust systems that allow uh, member states to quickly respond to, for example, rises and falls in asylum seekers arriving in their territory. So at in this sense, they can actually lower the threshold at which we go into crisis or emergency modes. But financial instruments are also looked upon as a way or a mechanism to inject solidarity or revive solidarity among member states. So balancing all of these different kinds of objectives and agreeing and attaining consensus on how to pursue this is a key challenge. And this is also what is the aim of this particular session. So I now hand over to Professor Golden Lang to give the presentation on her background paper. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Um, before I start talking about money, um, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for the invitation and congratulate you uh, for this, what I believe to be an amazing event. Uh, I would like to thank every single person who made this possible, particularly those who read and commented on the background notes, uh, and to all of those who helped in so many organizational details. My special thanks goes to um, Professor Philippe de Broeker, who could not be with us today, but who has been the brain and the heart of this whole project and who continues to be the driving force and inspiration for all the members of the Odysseus Academic Network. Now, talking about the financial framework of EU migration and asylum policies is a delicate issue, especially today during the negotiations on the new multi-annual financial framework. In the next several minutes, I will try to summarize the main challenges I detected in my background note and offer some suggestions for future actions. But before that, I would like to emphasize two overarching messages that should not be forgotten. First, the discussion on the financial framework are much more than just about figures. If you remember the 1990s blockbuster, Jerry Maguire, the famous quote from the movie, show me the money, or show me the money, is not just about getting paid, but about showing what is valuable to us. Consequently, the EU budget will show what is currently most important for the European Union. The budget will reveal EU priorities and give a palpable indication on the future direction the European Union wants to take. It will at the same time be constrained by two factors. First, by the need to reach a political consensus, as the MFF requires a unanimous council vote, and by the inability to depart too far from the programs and allocations from the previous budgetary period. Second, the general EU budget, including its funds for migration, asylum and borders, remains too modest to cover for the actual needs. Without trying to trivialize the matter, this is like bringing a cake for 10 children to a party with 20, whereas each child represents a different EU policy and goal. 
if you want everybody to get a slice, at least some slices will have to be very thin. For this reason, increasing the EU budget would be essential to facilitate a more successful accomplishment of all the EU ambitions, while at the same time promoting EU integration and solidarity. A more radical reshaping of EU resources would enable a more radical redistribution. For this, political will would be imperative. This could be done by contemplating the types of MFF resources and by including new types of EU's own resources. However, we need to be realistic and address the EU budget as it now stands, with all its limitations. And this leads me to the main challenges and suggestions for the future. As you can see in the background note, I singled out six challenges and accompanied them with initial suggestions on how to deal with them in the future. The first challenge I detected is solidarity, budget distribution, and proportion between the EU and national contributions. Here I would like to raise three points. First, the EU asylum legislation has had very diverse and uneven financial and other impacts on different member states, putting much more pressure on some member states than on others. It is therefore logical that the EU asylum legislation is accompanied by the obligation of solidarity and fair sharing of responsibility. Second, Joint EU funding is just one of the solidarity tools that should be employed, while others include sharing refugees in a relocation system and operational activities organized at the EU level by enhancing the role of EU agencies. And third, while acknowledging the fact that the EU budget plays only a complementary role and should not replace national expenditures in the area of migration, asylum, and borders. The fact remains that the current EU budget covers only a minor part of national expenses, and this is not likely to change in the new MFF. In addition, the available data suggests that the current allocation on the Asylum, Migration, and Integration Fund to member states is not always proportionate to the number of asylum requests in a number of member states, which calls into question the fairness of the distribution. The proposal for the new Asylum and Migration Fund goes in the right direction by using a more nuanced approach and distribution key, which combines a fixed amount of 5 million euros per member state with a variable amount calculated by weighing statistical information for each member state for the three years preceding the date when the AMF becomes applicable. In this line of thought, the initial suggestions on how to improve solidarity are, first, when calculating the EU financial contributions to member states, not absolute, but relative figures based on member states' GDP should be used. Second, part of EU funding should be earmarked to enable actions that promote solidarity and mutual trust, such as relocations and joint actions. Third, the migration, asylum, and border control budget should be increased in order to contribute by a higher share to national expenditures. And fourth, the mode, the mode of distribution of migration, asylum, and borders budget should ensure a fair subnational distribution so that allocations are more nuanced by being attributed to regions and cities in member states, especially in places where they, they are most needed. The second challenge that I would like to single out is the increased use of flexibility tools and emergency measures, which were needed to respond to the changing migratory inflows in the EU over the past few years. In the 2015 to 2018 period, the flexibility instrument was used four times and the contingency margin twice, 
and they jointly covered 46% of the financing for migration, asylum, and border control. The new MFF proposes increased flexibility in order to respond to emergency situations. To that effect, part of the Asylum and Migration Fund and the Integrated Border Management Fund would not be nationally pre-allocated, but would be left for disposal based on future needs. In this context, I would like to ma make the following two suggestions. First, there should be a right balance between the amount of the budget earmarked for emergency situations and the pre-allocated budget in order to ensure predictability of the spending and its coherence with the strategic objectives. How come one minute? I, was, I thought it's 15 minutes altogether. Yeah, okay. So it's not one minute. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right. Second, sorry, second, uh, part of flexibility spending should be structurally included into the permanent pre-allocated EU migration, asylum, and border budget in order to prevent the crisis mode in emergency funding from becoming a regular modus operandi. The third challenge is ensuring coherence of the external dimension of migration, asylum, and border policies, which is mostly taking place through the financing of cooperation with third countries in order to reduce migration flows and enhance returns and readmission. There has been a multiplication of external financial instruments, and they have been allocated more resources than internal ones. The mixed nature of some of these funds which have been partly financed from the EU budget and partly from additional contributions from member states, leads to a lack of transparency, accountability, and democratic control. It is difficult to trace where and how these resources are actually used in practice. In this context, the initial suggestions are, the activities taken within the sphere of external dimension of migration, asylum, and borders have to be complementary to the basic premises of the internal dimension. Second, better coordination should exist among DG Home, DEFCO, and NIR to ensure coherence and prevent funding of parallel structures and policies. And third, the Commission should provide more comprehensive reporting uh, about the funding of migration, asylum, and borders outside the EU in order to enhance transparency, accountability, and democratic control, especially in case of mixed funding. The fourth challenge is promoting the involvement of civil society, as well as cities and other local authorities, which have been playing an ever-growing role with regard to third country nationals' integration, since the vast majority of third country nationals live in urban areas. However, the funding rules for Asylum Migration and Integration Fund have created significant barriers to the participation of civil society organizations. Therefore, the initial suggestions from the background would be to enhance the involvement of civil society actors and local authorities in all phases of the funded projects, from the planning to the implementation. Then, to alter the application and participation criteria for the funding of projects to enable easier access and participation of civil society actors, including smaller NGOs and NGOs with a more operational focus, and this should be done by lowering the co-financing requirement and simplifying administrative and reporting requirements. And third, checks should be made to ensure that the funding allocated to member states for the integration of third country nationals is reaching and being spent mainly by regional and local authorities. The fifth challenge is to ensure that putting increased emphasis on the external dimension of the asylum migration and migration by investing significant resources to cooperation with third countries 
does not lead to neglecting refugees' rights and migration management. And in this respect, I would like to single out one of the four suggestions I made in the background note. A sufficient part of asylum funding should be earmarked for enhancing human rights compliant asylum procedures, reception conditions, and integration of refugees. Additionally, a separate part of the funding should be earmarked especially for integration of refugees. The last challenge I detected was the increased use of conditionality. In addition to the enabling conditions contained in the Common Provision Regulation, the new MFF relies on conditionality more than ever. And here I would like to demonstrate this with two examples. First, the proposal is to link cohesion funds to the number of refugees taken in each member state with a view to integrating them. This link should be viewed not only um, not as conditionality strict of sensu, but as an element of distribution key of cohesion funds whose purpose is to incentivize member states and reflect the situation on the ground. The proposal has, been op has opened up the debate on the objectives of structural funds as visible from the opposed reactions by some member states. And second, the rule of law conditionality, which is applicable not only to migration and asylum, but to the whole of the EU budget, is embodied in a newly proposed regulation on the protection of the Union's budget in case of generalized deficiencies as regards the rule of law in member states. The proposed regulation establishes a link between member states' violation of the rule of law and the suspension of EU payments. It is, however, questionable to what extent the rule of law conditionality will lead to the transformation of anti-rule of law trends in the concerned member states, which opens up the question of whether it will do more harm than good by creating a climate prone to anti-EU uh, positions. And in this respect, my initial suggestion would be to ensure that conditionality has political and societal support in the member state it is directed to by promoting the values supported by the conditionality rules. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now turn to our panelists who have the time to comment on the, mention, the points mentioned by Iris. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Iris, for the, for Iris for the presentation. Um, I think the background note reflects the challenge that we stand before today, namely the question on how to shape and define the role of migration within the next multi-annual financial framework. Um, so I would like to reflect on two elements in particular, namely migration conditionality and uh, uh, followed by a few remarks on the extra dim uh, dimension. Um, so first of all, migration conditionality. Uh, two general remarks to start off with. Uh, in general, we believe that uh, the EU budget should be flexible. Uh, it should be able to allocate resources quickly, preferably within the programs and headings, to be able to respond to migration challenges in a quick way. Um, and secondly, the MFF should also actively stimulate member states to contribute to the implementation of the asylum acquis. Conditionality can be considered both as a means to further target spending, but also as a way to create stronger incentives within the EU budget to create a common approach towards EU policy, uh, EU policy priorities such as migration. Um, the Netherlands has worked on a few elements um, with the purpose of translating this element of migration conditionality into concrete proposals. I would like to discuss three of them with you today. Um, so first of all, the performance reserve. Uh, instead of relying on a static distribution key that is valid for the entire seven-year period, the Netherlands proposes to make the GHA funds more flexible and adjustable um, to, in, uh, in order to respond to uh, the ever-evolving migration challenges. In our view, reducing the size of the national envelope in favour of the thematic facility would be a way forward in this respect. 
Um, also, we propose to incorporate an incentive into the MFF uh, to enhance solidarity and responsibility of member states when it comes to the implementation of the common European asylum system. One way to do this is to incorporate a horizontal enabling condition in the common provisions regulation. This way, the European Commission would be able to suspend the payment of the underlying funds in case a member state fails to live up to the required conditions. Thirdly, the Netherlands proposes to earmark a certain percentage within the ESF plus, around 5 to 10 percent, for programs specifically targeting the long-term integration of third country nationals. In our view, these elements would make the MFF more flexible, more adjustable, thus better able to respond to migration challenges, and also it would stimulate uh, member states to actually implement the common European asylum system. So then a few remarks on the external uh, dimension. Um, first of all, uh, a comprehensive migration policy should be properly reflected in the new MFF. This means that there should be a complementary link in spending and programming in the EU internal and external dimension. In 2015 and 16, it became clear that the external financing instruments weren't sufficiently flexible to cope with the migration challenges either. Uh, this is why several additional facilities were created, for example, the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa. In our view, um, under the new MFF, the external financing instrument should be developed in such a way that there would be no longer any need for separate trust funds. So looking at the Ndici, for example, um, in addition to regular long-term country planning, there should be an identified mechanism within the NDG to be able to respond to the migration challenges also in the external dimension. Um, and in addition, the NDG should also enable the EU to be able to uh, conclude comprehensive partnerships and agreements with countries of origin, destination, and maybe, and also transit countries. Um, and finally, as a concluding remark, it is important to have in place a proper governance structure uh, in order for member states to be actively involved with setting of priorities, programming, planning, uh, and monitoring of, uh, of implementation, uh, while overseeing both activities under Heading 4 and 6 of the MFF. Thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for outlining some of the potential tools in terms of performance reserve, earmarking, how you and the, the Dutch government envisage how this could actually result in greater flexibility, but also some kind of conditionality in the upcoming financial instruments. We now turn to Ari Vanilla. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Good morning, participants. And I would like to thank you also from my side for this opportunity to being here. So I, I'm coordinating um, uh, home funds for the next MFF period, so I'm obviously talking a lot about funding in, in my presentation. So we have, um, we have three funds, main funds in DG Home. We have uh, Asylum and Migration Fund, of course, and then we have uh, uh, Border Management and the Visa Instrument of the Integrated Border Management Fund, and then third, we have also Internal Security Fund, so that's the uh, that's the uh, structure of our funds. Uh, very briefly, as regards the scope of our funds, we have uh, seen in our ex post evaluations of 2007, 2013, and interim evaluations of, of the current period that the scope of our, our funds is it's right. So our funds, they provide EU added value, so we haven't had really huge need uh, to change the scope of our funds. But there is one message which is clear from all sides, from all stakeholders, that there hasn't been enough flexibility on our funds. So we have to increase flexibility. You have heard, hear, heard that from our uh, uh, colleagues here in the panel. So flexibility is really the key element of, of our proposals for the next period. Um, we have also proposed as a commission, we have proposed quite significant increase for our funds. If we take asylum and migration fund in the current period, it's, it's AMIF, uh, the initial budget for the AMIF was a bit more than three billion. Now today, because of 2015 and 16 crises, uh, it has been increased to 6.8 billion, so it's more than doubled. And for the next period, our proposal is 10.4 billion, plus the agency, EAS or EU agency for asylum it's uh, 865,000 uh, million, million. But that's the commission proposal. We have started uh, just the negotiations with the parliament and the council, so obviously they 
would be some cut, so at the end of the day, we don't have such a high budget. But in any, any case, I'm convinced that we have a much more funding for the next period than in the current period. But the flexibility is not only that. So in the current period, we almost allocated almost all funding in the beginning of the programming period, which of course caused problems where we needed additional funding. So we were actually, uh, in terms of budget management, we were at the borderline of the sound budget management because we were obliged to find new funding suddenly in 2015 and 2016. So what we have decided, what we have proposed, we have proposed that only 50%, half of the, uh, our funding envelope, actually for all three funds, is allocated in the beginning of the programming period. And then we have this fixed amount, five million, uh, which was referred also by Madame Cordner Lang. So that's the uh, insert masses of scale in the beginning of programming period that member states then kick off their programs uh, easily. And then this 50% of the funding, it's based on, uh, it's linked to our specific objective of our proposal, but it reflects the uh, asylum objective, it reflects the legal migration integration objective and also irregular migration objective. But it doesn't mean that the member states should implement those uh, policies in the, in the member state as the money was allocated. It's only to allocate the funding. The real issue is then the programming process in the member states. How, which sort of programs they, uh, they will create because they should be based on needs in that specific country. In different member states you have obviously different needs, so that's why this programming process is really the key, not really the allocation of funding. It's just to allocate funding between member states. And then 2024, we have midterm review. That's Means, that means update of the allocation criteria, so 10% of that uh, initial funding envelope will be allocated uh, in 2024. And then remaining amount, 40%, it's uh, like, uh, Madam Dijkstra referred to thematic facility, it's called thematic facility. It's something which is not earmarked in the beginning of the period. So every two years we will uh, establish a work program which allows us to steer funding to those areas where there are highest needs, where the EU added value is the highest uh, one. So that gives us more flexibility. And I'm very pleased that in the negotiations, what we have had so far, and when I look at the uh, negotiating mandate of the Council and the Parliament, they haven't really questioned uh, this thematic facility, even the level of thematic facility. Of course, you have some discussions whether it should be 40%, 30%, or even more than 40%, but still, there is a strong support for increased flexibility in our funds. Um, then, although uh, we have proposed significant increases to our funds, we cannot cope all, all uh, migration security challenges by our funds. As, uh, as it was said, they have to, EU funds have to be complementary to national funding. So we have to do the right things. We have to do something which provides EU added value. Uh, and moreover, we have to also uh, provide, contribute migration security objectives across other, other policy areas in the, in the EU budget. So what we have, the main, main other contributors uh, so far, what we have opposed will be European Social Fund Plus in the area of integration measures. So we don't have clear delineation line, but we, in our proposal, we should support from our fund early integration measures and then ESF Plus medium and long-term integration measures because they have a lot more funding. In their proposal, they have proposed 100 billion for ESF plus. So our proposal is 10 billion, so it's a much less, and only integration is only one of those three specific objectives. Uh, then, uh, as regards external dimension, there we have some political challenges because our instruments are mainly for internal policies, so that's why uh, some stakeholders have uh, problems to, to accept that uh, our funds are, are used for external dimension, but we think that most actions, they start in the, in the European Union and they finish in third countries or vice versa, so external dimension is very, very relevant for us. So, but it's true here as well that uh, NDG is, is the main primary source for uh, actions in third countries. There is now target level that 10% of the uh, NDG is, will be dedicated to migration related expenditure, which means in financial terms around 9 billion, which is uh, much more what we can provide. So we want to contribute tailor-made actions in third countries uh, 
not more than that. So we complement NDG, but obviously governance and coordination with uh, DG Near and uh, DG DevGo is very important, as well as in the case of integration uh, or uh, coordination and governance with uh, with the DG employment should be should be uh, highlighted. Then uh, briefly um, about conditionalities. Conditionalities. We you can choose between stick and carrot, and you can actually use both of them. We prefer carrots. We, we, we try to have positive incentives. This thematic facility is one of those positive incentives because there you can steer funding. You can decide at, at the later stage of the funding period where you, can, you, where you want to allocate funding, where you have your added value, where you have priorities. So that's the positive, uh, positive uh, incentive. Uh, as regards uh, negative incentives, there was also a reference to rule of law, but it's the horizontal issue. Very briefly, I come back briefly to the flexibility instruments. I was talking about uh, flexibility uh, means in built to our funds, but then you have these horizontal flexibility tools which are common to all policy areas in the EU budget. You have this uh, flexibility instrument, you have contingency margin, so you have also there some flexibility elements. Of course, we have still have uh, EMAS. Uh, so emergency assistance, what we can provide. Today we can provide it only in direct management, in future we can also provide it in shared management, shared management which is the novelty in, in our funds. I see that the, uh, my time is already up. One last line, it's about partnership principle. When we come back to programming uh, process, it's up to member states to, to, to really encourage that the local, regional uh, authorities and civil society organizations are included into into programming process. We have also incentive there, positive incentive, because usually our co-financing rate, so we will provide 75% of actions, support 75% of actions, but in case of uh, uh, integration measures implemented by regional local authorities, we can provide 90% co-financing support. So there we have also positive incentive. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ari, also for uh, responding to some of the issues that was raised by uh, Aris in her paper in terms of the, the scope or the, the volume of the, the envelope that is being put forward, thinking through how there can be flexibility in terms of assigning only a part of uh, the budget at the at the outset and then through the midterm review, thinking through what are some of the additional priorities and linking up also with the... Um, um, the involvement of different kind of partners when then the budget is exactly translated into national programs and translated into action on the ground. Uh, we now uh, open up um, the discussion to, to the audience. So if there are particular questions that you would like to pose to the different panelists, uh, please raise your hand and please, uh, please briefly introduce yourself before then stating your question. And if you're addressing it to a particular person, that would be useful. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Uh, hello, thank you. My name is uh, Julia. I work for MEP Tineke Strik in the European Parliament. Um, I have some questions uh, about the remarks that you all made about flexibility uh, within the instruments, uh, specifically uh, when it comes to the external dimension of uh, migration policy. Um, I think one of the things that um, is difficult, especially for the European Parliament, is the accountability gap that we see uh, is being created, uh, or being created, I don't, <clears throat> I don't uh, want to put it like that, but I think that there's at this point uh, quite a lack of transparency in these external policies. Um, some of you mentioned the NDG, and within the NG NDG there's already a pillar for uh, emergency response. Uh, and you also see there a lowering of standards when it comes to uh, monitoring, when it comes to evaluation, uh, and when it comes to accountability. So I would like some of you to maybe reflect on that, how you, <coughs> uh, how you think emergencies uh, should be defined, um, and what role you see there for uh, all the institutional actors involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there additional questions? Otherwise, we'll take them at the same time. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Paula Garcia Andrade. I'm Associate Professor of EU Law from Comillas Pontifical University in Madrid. Thank you very much to the panelists. I would like to, to make a comment, a question, I would say. You are referring to these external ad hoc instruments, uh, namely Professor Golden Lang 
criticize uh, their multiplication because of uh, the lack of transparency, accountability, and democratic control. Uh, I, I am concerned about their legal basis. Uh, fortunately, when the AMIF and the ISF funds were adopted in 2014, they were based correctly, in my view, in Title V of the TFEU, so on migration legal basis. So including the financing of external dimension actions with migration-driven objectives and not uh, and and by that, uh, in that way, stopping to use the development cooperation legal basis of the treaties. So that was fortunate. Unfortunately, these ad hoc instruments as the Refugee Facility for Turkey of the, or the EU Trust Fund for Africa, their commission decisions were based on the development cooperation legal basis and there are some reports and even I think there's a resolution from the European Parliament stating that some of these actions are migration control oriented or driven. So uh, I don't know whether it is better to exclude this kind of ad hoc instruments as Mrs. Stigstra pointed out or either use the proper legal basis and thus the correct funding. Otherwise the development money is used for migration driven objectives and not for the eradication of poverty. Thank you. Thank you for your question. A third or final question? Thank you very much, Joost Larenbeek, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Netherlands. Um, I have two questions that may be considered cynical. They are not, please, they're very serious. Um, I mean, this uh, session, including the background paper, for obvious, oh, it's obviously focusing on the, the size and also the shape of the EU envelope. Um, my first question is, shouldn't we also have a good idea of national spendings in EU member states on uh, asylum and immigration policies? I think if you would have that picture, it would be very enlightening also in um, the kind of uh, balances that we hope to establish. And the second point, uh, again, it may sound cynical, it is not, it's very serious, is do we, do we actually solve our problems by throwing more money at it, by definition? Um, I mean, one obvious example is, is, is Greece, for instance, which has received, I think, well over 2.2 2 billion, I think, and Greece, Greek officials are saying themselves, that in the end, the money is not the problem. The problem is implementation of existing acquis in the field of asylum and migration. So I believe that in the future, um, MFF, we should be also looking through that prism in the sense of how can we promote um, the, a good functioning of asylum migration policies in member states. Thank you. Thank you very much for those interesting questions. In the interest of time, I will ask the panelists to focus on one particular question, if that's uh, responding to it, so that we then can go into but in the, the coffee break. Um, maybe you can uh, address the issue of the, the legal basis, uh, okay. Professor. Okay. And that uh, maybe, Ari, if you can come back also to the issue about uh, transparency and how to improve the monitoring and evaluation of spending in the external dimension. And maybe you uh, could re uh, respond to the question about yeah, how do we actually know what national spending is being targeted at or uh, applied to, and uh, is there actually a solution in terms of throwing more money, or do we need to think about how we build better, robust systems? Thank you. All right, so with regard to, to the second question on the legal basis, uh, yes, I, I believe I am there with you. I know that there is a problem, not always, of course, but sometimes you could argue that the money which is uh, legally based on the provisions on development aid have a different goal. Sometimes, of course, it's a mixed goal. Sometimes by promoting development in certain regions, you actually provide less incentives to migrate. But sometimes, if you are actually investing into certain types of infrastructures and so on, the goal is a little bit different. It's not, as the treaty provides, the legal basis of development aid and humanitarian aid should be a reduction and eradication of poverty, but the goal and the motives behind uh, the money, the, the reasons why the money is spent are somehow different. And legally speaking, yes, 
you could argue that there is there is a problem there. And I see this happening uh, also in the area uh, of conditionality, actually, and the new proposal for the regulation on the rule of law that establishes a link between uh, a member state's violation of the rule of law on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, uh, the EU suspending payments from the EU budget. Uh, the proposed regulation has its legal basis uh, in the budgetary provisions of the treaty, which is understandable because basically you cannot find a rule of law provision in the treaty as such to, to use it as a legal basis. And you could argue that sometimes the link between the violation of the rule of law on the one hand and the suspension of the EU payment because uh, a certain EU project is not implementing cor in being implemented correctly, that this link is sometimes too weak. So I, I see this happening in cases where the EU simply lacks uh, an appropriate legal basis. And this is not the best solution, but sometimes you can say that certain motives are you know, searching for the legal for the legal basis in the treaty. So um, I don't know what would be the solution for that, yeah. Okay, so um, if I may reflect on, uh, on uh, the question posed actually by my colleague. <laughs> but um, no, um, indeed, I agree with you. Throwing money at the problem is not uh, a way to find a solution. Um, uh, so I think it's it's not only about increasing the EU budget, but it should, um, for example, by the midterm review, looking critically at the efforts and the needs by member states that may change over time. Also, we need to look at the absorption ca capacity. If a member state is not able or capable to, to implement or allocate resources quickly enough, um, then adding even more funds to that particular member state would, would create additional problems, I would say. Um, uh, so yeah, that was were two points I would like to uh, make regarding that question. And if I may briefly reflect on the NDC question, I heard the question about the transparency and, um, and why not using the emergency question. Um, indeed, the tra transparency is a very, very important element that we try to solve with um, um, basically um, creating all the separate instruments into one, the 10% um, migration target within the NDG in order to have a bigger role of member states as well regarding the monitoring and uh, evaluation in order to improve the tra transparency of the instrument. And why not use the cushion? The cushion that is related to the entire instrument uh, of which migration is only one of the few uh, objectives. So therefore we fear that there wouldn't be enough uh, flexibility in order to respond as I said earlier, to, to the challenges that we stand before today. Thank you. So, um, so, so far we have mainly implemented uh, actions in third countries uh, through direct and indirect ma management, uh, for instance, through IOM and UNHCR. Uh, as regards uh, external dimension uh, implemented through uh, member states in shared management, in our legal proposal we have a new development which means that the, every time member states are planning to implement action in third countries they have to consult uh, the commission, so we are following in that sense those actions and also they have to uh, justify uh, complementarities and synergies with the NDG. So that, that's one, one way of uh, following up uh, the actions in the third countries. Uh, of course, we, we don't uh, allow funding going to third countries if we don't have legal uh, insurance that the monitoring, uh, control and management systems are working well, so we can be in search of uh, regularity and uh, legality of the actions carried out in, in third countries. Uh, as regards transparency and reporting, uh, I think uh, this is very, uh, very uh, hot topic also in our negotiations uh, with the Parliament and the Council. So wherever we find uh, problems and uh, room for development, of course, we consider uh, those things ourselves. So um, that's the main thing. But I, I can highlight that uh, this external dimension, it's really it's one of the key elements in our negotiations for the next period. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Sorry, if I may, uh, I just remembered that I forgot to, to address one element, namely uh, the need to have an overview of the spending on the asylum and migration key by all member states. Uh, I think this is exactly what we are currently missing. Um, in order to formulate a, an ob objective analysis of, of the actual needs of member states, we should also look at what they already have and what they are spending and what they are programming already. Um, so I think that's also something that we need to take into account with negotiating the next MFF, is uh, in order to make a good decision, we should have a good overview of what's already happening. And know, and know where we can find the data on that. <laughs> and then we have to close. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, one more comment, because there was a point that uh, it would be useful to know how much member states are spending from their national treasuries to migration security policies. So it's true, it would help mapping of needs in, in the EU, but uh, it's of course, it's about the willingness of member states. So we cannot, as a commission, we cannot impose such a reporting from the member states. I know that there have been some initiatives and uh, actually I was a bit surprised that the uh, member states seems to be quite uh, cooperative in this area, but it hasn't developed a lot. We are now still in the starting phase of this uh, process. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank all panelists and also the audience for participating. And I'll hand over to the organizers because I know we're into the coffee break, so you can.